Lord, we don't have to try to hide. We don't have to pretend. We have to acknowledge Your greatness, Your grace, and Your mercy. Lord, You're the only one that can heal us. You're the only name under heaven and earth that man may be saved. You're the only one that loves us enough to forgive us every time. I believe the Lord wants me to take authority over a spirit of rejection. Some of you have been rejected by families, by spouses, by friends. But the Lord would say to you, you've allowed or what has come even unknowingly to you, a spirit of rejection. And you live life with sort of the, 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 your feelings on your sleeves. You're, you're, you're tentative. You feel unworthy. You feel unloved. And the Lord would say to you this morning, I love you. Hear the word from our sister from the Lord. And I take authority in the name of Jesus Christ. And I break every assignment of authority, uh, 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 of authority every assignment of rejection over every person in this room who for whatever reason has lived under a negative spirit of rejection. I take authority and I cast that out in Jesus' name. Release it. If you've lived with a, a, under a, an attitude of people are going to reject you, people don't like you, and I want you just to quietly open your hands and just let it go. Just let it go. This is in the name of Jesus. We are letting go. We are taking authority in the name of Jesus over those demonic spirits of rejection that have tried to keep you away from not only the Lord, you felt He even has rejected you. He has not. We take authority over that spirit of rejection and we declare you have no place, no parcel within this church, within this fellowship, within these feet people. I believe the Lord would say to some, you feel it's a generational curse. It's come down through the generations. Your family's just been alienated. You've been seen as unique. That's a nice word. But you just feel that it's your lot in life. And I say to you, it's not your lot in life in the name of Jesus. And that curse, that family demonic thing that's come down through the generations stops right now. It stops in your generation. You take authority in the name of Jesus. You break it. You declare that I am accepted in the beloved. He loves me. I am the apple of his eye. He will not reject me. He died for me. He who knows me best loves me most. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. You've already notated the cards. If you have a need, please fill it out. You're all welcome. By the way, welcome. I don't see the two of them. Welcome. We do not have any uh, visitors. We never have visitors to this church. Ever. We don't have visitors. I don't. They here, that's why. Well, they're guests. The Holy Spirit brought them as our guests. And one of the things the uh, team that, that is our welcoming committee is that they're never to say visitors. It's because I believe very strongly that the Holy Spirit builds the church. I believe very strongly that the Holy Spirit decides who should be there and who shouldn't. I believe if we're submitted to the Holy Spirit, and I believe if you're submitted, they'll, you'll show up here. You didn't fall out of bed, roll downhill, and roll in here. For whatever reason, 
you were led here by the Holy Spirit of God. He's led you here to encourage you, to love on you, to allow us to love on you. Perhaps he's led he, here you to bring hope to your life through his son, Jesus Christ. So I welcome you guests. We honor you as our guests. Amen? Good morning. What's next? College age group is off for next week because Tom and Kath here down south. We have part of our family going south, part of your family going to the Dakotas, South Dakota. I'm going to see that uh, big rock. Four nose rock. What is that? Mount Rushmore. I, 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 how many have been to Mount Rushmore? I was. Yeah. <clears throat> 60 years ago. But, uh, you know what I really liked doing when I went, went towards Route, Mush, Route Moore? I was really impressed with um, Custer's Last Stand, Little Bighorn. That was quite an interesting place. Even as a kid, I, I don't remember about much about that, but I do remember walking the hills around there. So, Lord, bless and keep our people that are traveling. Amen. It is. By the way, when did it, spring, uh, when did it change? I, I don't know. I must be getting old. Um, I always thought it was Easter break. When did it sp change to spring break? When did it change? Because I remember going to school. It was always spring break. I mean, I was Easter break. We always had Easter break. Didn't we? But anyway, it's good. They're out of school. <laughs> Are they even back in school? Yeah, <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I heard, well, they're on break. And I'm thinking, well, well I thought the big deal was to get them back in school. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Lord bless them. Intercessory prayer at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. High school, going great. They're having a great time. The Lord's really working in that group. I've Stopped in there a couple of times. They've got a great bunch of high school youth, and they've got a great high school pastor and his wife. So they're having fun. Right, Dustin? Yeah, yeah. And Cowan's been there. He's been helping. Are you leading worship yet? Not yet. These kids need to learn to worship. Men, we're having our last Friday night men's group. By the way, I want to tell you guys, this will be our last Friday night's men group. This will be our last Friday night's men group. Whoever decided to have men's group on Friday nights needs their head examined. Oh, everybody's exhausted. Everybody's dragging in. From now on, we're going to have men's Bible studies, but it's not going to be on Friday nights. So be there. It's going to be a great time. Kingdom men, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, if you have signed up, even if you haven't signed up for Christ and Passover for your Seder meal, Carol, is there still time? Okay. See, Carol, we have, how, I don't know how many we have. We have a number coming to this. 32? Okay, good. Um, does anybody know, everybody knows what a Seder meal is. Everybody understands that everything at Passover represents Christ. Everything in the Passover meal represents Christ. And everything from the, the, the lamb to the blood, everything on that table. And then it really enhances and enriches your understanding of what God has done. They looked forward to the Messiah. We look back. We have the Messiah. We have the promise currently. Amen? So, it's 4 o'clock uh, Saturday uh, in the Grace Center, and if you'd like to be a part of that, see, please see Carol. Okay, if you can't afford it, it's $10 a family, and if you can't afford it, um, church will pick it up. Uh, probably give it to Carol or put it in and mark it because there's some things we need to buy first. And if you're willing to help set up or help cook, see Carol. Notice how I always say, see somebody else? That's important because that way it gets done. Here's one that only some of you will get. Go see Cal.
Anybody ever see a Cal Worthington commercial? That guy owned his own zoo. I mean, he'd have elephants and camels and monkeys, and that guy made a fortune. Uh, he had a house in Corning, California, Cal Worthington did. Anyway. Romans 12, 9 says this. Let your agape love be without hypocrisy. Agape love is unconditional. It's God's love. It doesn't have any conditions. It loves even if it's not loved back. Amen? Okay, now this isn't the sermon. It's just something in my weekly devotion this week that just pounded on me. I, I wrote it, rewrote it, played with it. I was going to do a sermon on it, and I didn't feel the Lord wanted me to do a sermon about it. I just want to make it real clear to you. Let your agape love be without hypocrisy. That means two-faced. Hate. Some of your Bibles will have abhor, but it's the very vile word hate. I, uh, this week was, I have an acquaintance from high school, and we are on the opposite spe spectrums of everything. And uh, he's, he's an atheist. What I don't understand about atheists, how come they get married by Wiccans? So that always, you know, I'm thinking, well, well, if you don't believe that, just go to courthouse. You know? but, but he, you know, I don't, I pray for him all the time. In fact, I write, I pray. So we're going back and forth about uh, silly stuff. Not silly stuff, very serious stuff. Well, you're a hater. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. We disagree. And, and we had some points on, uh, you know, you, you, you're afraid of this council. I said, no, I just believe I want to be able to speak the, the word in truth. Well, you, you, you can't just have your truth. And I said, no, no, there's just one truth. We went back and forth. And, and he's a pretty guy. We, and I was, even Kathy, she's not here today. I said, come here and read this and make sure that I'm not too mean-spirited. And she says, boy. Because she, she goes, man, the Lord must have wrote that for you. I thought, <laughs> thank you. And so we went back and forth. And he'd do something, and I'd send it back. And all of a sudden, it was like, you know, and then I said, I'm praying for you. Click, and then boom, the whole thing went. He canceled the whole thing out. And we were talking about the cancel culture. You won't listen and debate what we have to say. You just want me to be silent. And... There's a whole thing out there in the world today where, you know, well, you're a hater. You're a hater. If I, if I disagree with you, you're a hater. No, I'm not. The Bible says, abhor, hate what is evil. Why do I hate what is evil? Because evil destroys lives. Evil diminishes people. For God so loved the world, the people that he came to see. He didn't come to condemn them, but they might be saved. I will not allow myself to be called a hater. Except for sin. I hate sin. Because see, sin keeps people from Jesus and the life that God has on. But stand for what is good and godly. How's that working for us? Amen? I will not be silenced. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for in it is the power of God. So, loved ones, let's abhor what is evil and let's stand for what is good. Let's not be silenced. Amen? Amen? Living focused on Jesus frees us. Living focused on God's kingdom and His righteousness. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Well, what's all these things? We've well, got to go back and read all that. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are the Beatitudes. And basically, they're the Beatitudes because they tell us these need to be your attitudes. This is, what, this is how you're supposed to live your life. 
Focus frees us. It frees us from the pressure of the moment to work for the eternal. These need to be our attitudes. Jesus just didn't state what needs to be our attitude or a right perspective and a right focus. He tells us how to obtain that and how to live for that, what is needful and eternal without losing the present. Focus. A point to which something converges. Adjustment for distinctiveness or clarity. An object of interest or activity. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his way of living. And all these things shall be added unto you. Focus does a lot of things in our life, amen? When you're focused on something, I hope you're all focused on a righteous life in God. Other things don't seem quite as bad, quite as important. In high school, I, we punted on the fourth play of the game, and we punted, and I ran down and um, was in on the melee of something called a tackle. And as I went to get up, um, somebody, purposely or not purposely, I don't know, those are the days when rocks were soft and uh, cleats were three-quarters of an inch long. And the person just happened to stand on my hand and twist. So it broke all four fingers and it dislocated all four fingers back here. Well, I got up and I ran over to the coach and he looked at me and the fingers were hanging off this way and that way. And, you know. and he says, you want to play? I said, of course I want to play. He goes, look that way. So I looked that way and he goes, pop, 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 pop. <laughs> okay, there you go. And I was in on the next series. Now, that hand because it was my left hand, didn't really bother me that much. I, I snapped the football with the right hand. The left hand just guides it. But I remember thinking in my, as my life went on, that should hurt because I've dislocated, I, I've dislocated a toe and thought I was going to die. I had gout and prayed to die of just a toe. How many have had gout? I mean, when you get gout in a toe, you just want to chop it off. But I remember being focused and, and not feeling the pain because I had a goal. I was focused. Often in life, if we can get focused on the things of God, all the other things that Satan tries to swoop in on us, to discourage us, to dismay us, to distort us, can be washed away because we're focused. Loved ones, Jesus is calling all of us to live a life of focus, focused on Him and His kingdom and His righteousness and our calling. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. Jesus was focused. None of us can probably imagine the pain that he went through in those hours. But for the joy, for the goal, he was focused. Are we focused on other people's lives? Are we focused? If we're focused, it'll bring us into control. It'll lose some other things that shouldn't be there. Jesus' object to focus was the return to relationship with you and I and our Heavenly Father, the setting free of mankind, the ability for man who would receive Him. By the way, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have got to quit using. For all people who would receive Him, man or woman. Thank you. To be able to live free in right relationship under God and be his ambassadors on earth. I don't know about you, but there's a lot around me to distract me. There's a lot of things screaming and yelling in every direction to get my distraction, to get my attention. Satan wants to get us distracted from our mission as God's ambassadors, and Jesus is calling us to focus on God's kingdom. Do you know what one of your jobs is? It's to change a hurting and a dying world, and you only do that. You don't do that through programs. You do that through Jesus. That's how you do it. When you bring the love and the life and the freedom and the peace of Jesus 
We're His ambassadors of peace. All too many believers get sidetracked and strayed and they lose focus of their calling to reach a hurting and dying world with the good news of Jesus. We see the pain around us. And by the way, if you don't want to help people that are down and out, if you don't want to help people that are lost, then my goodness, check your heartbeat. If it doesn't bother you about the things that are happening to people, the way that they're treating each other, the way they don't value life, Lord, give us a new heart if that's the way we're thinking. But we've got to quit believing that anything but Jesus Christ is going to cure this place. Only forgiveness through Jesus Christ begins the process of changing people's lives. It's got to start there. We are His ambassadors for the good news. There's hope, there's life through Jesus Christ. There's healing, there's the breaking of addictions through Jesus Christ. But that has to be where we start. We have to be so focused on Jesus Christ that the pettiness of the lies and the threats of the enemy do not shift us off that. Well, you're a hater. No, I'm not a hater. I hate sin. I love what is good and what will bring goodness to man, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only hope. Jesus in the Beatitudes gives us three A's in which we can live focused and free and fruitful. The first is our attitude. Matthew 6, 22-24. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your whole eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Huh? It's your attitude. If you get up with a bad attitude, everything is bad. We've all talked about having bad hair days. Jesus is saying we need to live with the right attitude. We need to begin to look at the world through the eyes of Christ, the eyes of the Word of God, that says there is hope, there is a cure for the malady of mankind and womankind. His name is Jesus. What occupies your thinking? What possesses most of your time? Is it the kids, the jobs, the bill, the relationships, or politics? Or is it God's Word, His presence, and His kingdom? I want to tell you right now that God's kingdom is among you now. Jesus said that the kingdom of God is among you now. The kingdom of God is not something that's all far, far away. The kingdom of God is among us now. The power of God is among us now. The hope of God is among us now. The life-changing, life-freeing, healing power of God is among us now because the kingdom of God is among us now. Amen? And you and I are ambassadors of that kingdom. God's kingdom is a real place. The king, the place where he is king. A place worth rules and regulations and opportunities, positions, peace, power, and promises are all present. The place where God is in charge. That's why Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because if you live in the kingdom of God, if you live in that right relationship with God, if you live in obedience to his word, then all the promises of God are yours. All the promises to Abraham are ours as we live submitted in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not something where you just do whatever you do, whatever you feel like. Whatever it will be, will be. I'll just get off my feet and run around. No, there's rules and regulations. There's calling and commission within the kingdom of God. 
And if we want to know the blessings of the kingdom of God, then we need to be people who are adherent to the Word of God. God is in charge. History is His story. It's His plan being accomplished by people people who seek His kingdom first. Where is our focus? I know people that are so focused on finances. Oh, I got to make this deal. I got to do this. I got to do this. Their life is complete. I don't have time. Uh, when, when I get financially independent, when I get financially free, then I can devote more time to God. That will happen when your, fo- when your nose does not fog up a mirror. If we keep putting off what God has called us to, for the pleasures of this world, we'll neither know either. We'll know either, neither. Maybe I should have more coffee. A double minded person is unstable in all their ways, James 1 8. Loved ones, either we are in focus and living for God and enjoying the benefits thereof, or we flounder in life. Either God is God in every area of our lives or He isn't. If not, those areas that we haven't turned over to Him, those areas that we're taking care of ourselves are going to lead to frustration and floundering and unfulfillment. Those areas in our lives where we know that the Lord has said, this is not good for you. This is not right for you. This is not how I designed you. This is not a lifestyle. This is not an attitude. This isn't what I designed for you. This will lead you to destruction and pain. Well, God, you don't understand. That's what I like best. No, 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 no. Anywhere that we knowingly disobey God, make excuses. How many of us have ever made excuses for sins or habits that we knew weren't good for us. Okay, there's, there's three of us. We don't, of us, oh, four of us, five of us, six of us. Okay, all the rest of you are going to pray for you guys. <laughs> because look, look what it says in Hebrews. And, and, and get back to that point. Let us strip away. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, cloud of witnesses, crowd of witnesses, to the life of faith, let us strip off everything, every weight that slows us down. Now, notice what it doesn't say, because it goes on, right after that, it goes on and says, let us throw off sin. Can there be things that slow us down on our focus or get us to get out of focus with God that truly aren't sins? Do we think so? True confession. Nah. Yeah. Nah. Did I write it down? Yeah, I wrote it down, so I have to. I have found that in my life as a believer of Jesus Christ and a lover of Jesus Christ, having been called of God, like you, I still loved Football. Football. I loved football. I watched football. I got special channels so I could watch football. My, when my Raiders were losing at halftime in 1970, whatever it was, we were building, we had some country property, and we were building a, a, a fence. I was building a fence when I was and uh, I had one of those post hole diggers. And I was so frustrated. So I love Jesus. I love Jesus. But I went out and got that post hole digger. And I did not realize it until about an hour and a half later. I had gone through my gloves and my wife happened to notice blood was pouring out of both of my hands. I was... And all of a sudden I thought, whoa... You need to probably uh, see somebody about that, son. (laughs) 
Everybody knows the story. First time I, uh, well, well, not the first time. The Raiders are in the Super Bowl. <laughs> By the way, if you look at my donor card, my donor type on the back of my blood type on the back of my wallet, silver and black. And uh, everybody knows the story. I mean, it's not a sin to love a sport. It's not a sin to love a musical instrument. It's not a sin to have these things. But when they take away, when they control, when what happens to that team that I have nothing to do with. By the way, Al Davis, I wish we'd have been friends in 1962. He bought the controlling interest of the then San Diego Raiders for $20,000. That's a billion dollar organization. I've probably spent more than 20000 on the Raiders material and stuff and tickets. <laughs> what I'm talking about is there are things. Jesus said, and the Bible says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Everything that slows us down. What slows you down? I realized as I got more and more mature. No, no. Anyway, Jesus kept talking to me about football and other sports. Because I just, just like sports. And by the way, that's good. And then all of a sudden I thought, you know what? Because of a number of things happening, I'm just going to quit watching. I'm just going to quit watching. Now, I have gone off. What was I on for six months? Liquid coating. Yeah. Because of some maladies and things in my life, I was on liquid coating and quite a bit of it. But I had to go off at cold turkey. Not the Lord told me to. And he said he'd take care of it. The Lord is a unique God who loves us. I shook and I sweated. It was intense. For about two weeks. Withdrawing from football was worse. <laughs> and from basketball, pro basketball. I, I, I withdrew myself from all professional sports over two years ago because I felt they were consuming my life. I felt that my attitude and actions towards people and things were, were, were marginalized by sports. So I just decided, you know what? Why don't I just quit watching? You know how much they saved us a year on our monthly cable bill? No sports channels. No more... I mean, I, I still have all the product. I have a hundred and some dollar Raider jacket. I got a Raider watch. I got Raider shirts. I got Raider sweats. I got Raider stocking caps. I probably even have Raider socks and pajamas someplace. But I tell you what, when I decided I'm not going to watch pro sports, I found hours and hours and hours of my day freed up. And by the way, when God does these kind of things, to me, to me, okay, to me, I found that he was calling me in another direction. Let's fill that time with something else. I can do a lot more reading I actually have time now to contemplate. I have time to muse, to write. I also have more time for finances. I think we've been going out on those, though. <laughs> but when I realized that it wasn't a sin, but it was something that was taking away, then I just said, okay, I, I don't need that. I remember talking to a good friend who absolutely loved their drive through coffees. Just loved them. And we were talking about something, and I was asking them how much it cost for the drive through coffees, and they were about 6 or $7 a cup at that time. I said, well, how many do you get a day? Two or three. Uh, okay, okay. And the Lord, just, that was it. We keep on moving. 
And all of a sudden, we, we come back around to missions. Now, this guy's got a doctorate of uh, ministry. He's a pastor. And, I, and he's still a good friend. And he says, man, I'd just love to give more to missions. I said, why don't you cut out two of those cups of coffee a day? He looked at me like I had horns. I mean, and I got to tell you, it was a few months later we were talking. He goes, I'm down to two cups a day. And I'm saying, I said, okay, okay. But he realized it wasn't a sin to like coffee. By the way, God drinks coffee. That's why he neither slumbers or sleeps. <laughs> I, come on, don't throw anything, okay? Just, just, and for you on the, the, the don't, I, I know, just don't send me the emails. I can do without them. Yeah, and make an extra pot. <laughs> but when our mind and our heart and our life is focused on the things of God, then we'll begin, the Holy Spirit will begin to show us the things that are diverting us. We all know the story of the prime little, prime little hunting hound. Oh, he was the best hound. They had bred him. He had the best lines, the best genealogy for hounds. He would be the greatest hound, fox hound in the world. And so he gets to go on his first fox hunt with all the other uh, hounds. And because he's this, oh, he's got a good voice, great legs. Oh, he can jump, great nose. He takes off to after the fox. He smells that fox and he's out in the front. He's just going. He's just going after that fox. Horns are blurring. The horses are, hooves are pounding. Ah, he's in the front of the pack. Doing what he was called to do. Doing what he was bred to do. Doing what his genealogy has said for him to do. This is his calling. I chase and catch the fox. So he's out in front and all of a sudden, Wabbit! Rabbit jumps up! Wabbit! He's running after the rabbit. Foxes keep going after the fox. He gets tired. The rabbit runs down a, a rabbit hole and goes, uh-oh. Oh, fox! Fox! Shoom, runs right back after the fox that catches up with the pack. He's running along. He's finally out in front of the pack. The hounds are baying. He's baying. He's gotten to the front. He's a little more tired now. The horses are running behind him with people on them. And I have the core peripheral vision of his right eye. There's a squirrel, and he's going, eh, 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 eh. He, oh, he goes after the squirrel. He goes over a... Log, he goes under the log, he goes over a bush, the churl, the squirrel goes up the tree, the hounds go by, the fox goes by, everybody goes by, and he's barking at the tree until he realizes, uh-oh, I'm supposed to be chasing that fox, not chasing the, ha not chasing the squirrel. He gets back on track again. And now he's exhausted. He can hardly keep up. He's run three, four times as far as everybody else has. He's not doing. He knows he was, he was bred. He was called to chase foxes. But see, the problem is he got deterred. See, that's what Satan will do to you and I. We know God's called us to love people, to call people to salvation through Jesus Christ. We know that God's given us talents and abilities. But we get so busy going off in other directions until they run into a dead end or go down a fox or to go down a rabbit hole that we, oh, that's what I forgot. And then we come back or we're a little bit more tired. Amen? We need to understand that God wants us to be a people who are single-focused for his kingdom, for people. We're not going to right all the wrongs in the world. Do you understand that? Do you understand that we cannot right all the wrongs in the world? We can love people to life in Jesus Christ. So let's get single focused. Let's not live frustrated lives. Let's be single focused in our finances. No one can serve two masters, verse 24. 
For either you will hate the one and love the other, or else you'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our tithes, our seeding, our harvest. Are we focused on God's kingdom with our finances? Are we obedient to it, to his word concerning our finances? But, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> My pastor friend does not buy coffees from that company anymore. He got a Keurig for his office. <laughs> Now, he probably drinks more than he ever did, but I'll tell you what, we were laughing at about, I don't know how long ago it was, we were laughing, and he was saying, hey, my missions, personal missions, has gone up twice. And I said, right on. You know, now, if God calls us to give up our courage, then we'll have to have a longer discussion. <laughs> have we planted God's seed so God can bless it. Is God directing your talent, your tithe, and your treasures? Or are you doing what seems best for you? I know people who say, well, you know, I just don't have time for that. I just can't afford to do that. I don't want to do that. But any place we deny God's word, any place where we see his word says this, and we make an excuse or we do a joyce and go, that's not going to work. By the way, I, I'm sorry. i got to come up with a minute because somebody may be named Joyce. Joyce was in our first church. Everybody knows the story. She was um, not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but her tongue was. And she, uh, they brought her into marital counseling. I was only in my 20s. She was in her 40s. And... Uh, Long and the short of it, I know the story. I said, you can't say that. You can't do that. That's not how you can act. That's not biblical. The Bible says this. No, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. No, mine doesn't. No, it doesn't. And I remember thinking, yeah, it does. No, it doesn't. Mine does not. The Bible, this is what Jesus said. No, he did not in my Bible. And I'd show it to her. It's right there in the love of Jesus and my good counseling skills. And she goes, no, I said, let me see your Bible. I opened it up, and every verse she didn't like had a felt tip black mark. You couldn't see it. She blacked out every verse she didn't like. (laughs) Now, we've talked about this a lot because we do this in our own life. We do this in our own life. I don't really like that verse, so I'm going to find some excuse not to adhere to that verse, to follow the thing. And, And don't blame God when we disobey the word of God that the door is then left open for the enemy to rob, kill, and destroy. Well, I can't. No. And so I apologize. I don't know if she's in heaven yet, but she'll get there. She'll get there. It's not up to me. Maybe. I'm not going to go there. But that poor lady has become an illustration for 40 years. So if you're watching, Joyce, get a new Bible! (laughs) We need to understand that the Bible is telling us this is how you're going to focus in life. This is what you need to do. You need to have that, that right attitude. Attitude in your finances. God says, I'll take care of every need you have. I'll take care of it. Attitude about what's going on in life. I'm going to be focused. I've got to be single focused. What about worry? Is that a way Satan gets us off track? How about politics? Nobody ever disagrees in politics. Everybody's so shiny, cleany. Don't say it. 
they're so clean. Nobody lies. No. Worry, stress causes us to lose focus. I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or what you will put on it. Is it not more is life not more than food and the body not more than clothing? Look at the birds of the field, and he goes on and talks about how he takes care of them. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to your statue? Anybody else want to be taller than they were? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So says the giant in the land. Everybody knows. When I was in 8th, ninth, 10th grade, I hung upside down with weights and bounced. I did everything I possibly... If I could have ordered a rack from England, just I knew that if I could just get to 6'3", I could play pro football. I just knew it. Even by hanging upside down with weights on my chest, I didn't grow. Some of my brains might have fallen out, but other than that, I was okay. But, you know, we we worry about things that I don't know we can do much about. So why do you worry about clothing? One of the good things... And I don't know how it happened. It had to be the Lord's grace. Is our kids growing up never had to have or they would die name brand clothes. First of all, we couldn't afford them. And then when the Lord knew it was a need, He'd send it. But how many do we know they have to have that name brand? they got to have that right look. Does anybody besides me know what I'm talking about? Got to have the right shoes. I saw a pastor in New York, and Lord bless him, I mean, if he can afford $1,300 tennis shoes. $1,300. $1,300 tennis shoes. If I get $1,300 tennis shoes, they'd better research and preach the sermon. <laughs> and Lord, if he, if he can afford it, that's fine. That's fine. I'm not saying. But the, the article was talking about how it attracts people. I don't know. I, I Just me. But, but Wow. And, and look, again, if you have finances and you have the wherewithal and God is releasing you and you're obedient to God and your finances and all His ways, that's fine. Please put that on speaker so we all know who we're talking to. Um, and anyway, by the way, you, everybody knows that's the rule. Phone goes off in church, you've got to put it on speaker so we all say, Hi! <laughs> but I don't begrudge anybody their finances, or how God has blessed them. If they made it legally and morally and culturally right. I mean, that's up to God. So I'll stop right there. But don't let worry, stress, cause us to lose our focus. Be anxious for nothing, but everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests made out unto God. We articulate and He adjusts. He answers. If we're not following, seeking first, the kingdom of God, living by the rules and the priorities and the principle of God's kingdom in our lives, then how can we claim the privileges? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all His righteousness and everything everything you need. It doesn't say everything you want, okay? God knows our needs. We as human beings, selfish human beings, often get our needs and wants mixed up. I need a 1972 
thousand candy apple red white interior. That's in two thousand. Nineteen seventy, excuse me, nineteen seventy. That's in two thousand. I need that guy. No, you don't, son. You have a nice van, and I supplied your need. See, I think my needs are, God doesn't understand them. Somebody, God understands my needs better than I do. I haven't got a ticket. Well, I got a lot more tickets when I was having the, when I owned the roaster. See, anywhere we leave open and we're not focused, Satan's going to take advantage of it. Is your heart right before God? Are you seeking his kingdom? Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Is our attitude, outlook, kingdom focused? See, that's the key. That's the key right there. First thing is our attitude. Look, we all know what it's like to get up and just be a grouch all day. Change your attitude. Okay? Okay? Second thing on having being focused is the atmosphere. Atmosphere. Once our attitude is set to follow Jesus, to seek first the, his good plan in our lives, we can see clearly concerning our atmosphere. Fear, worry, and anxiety are not ingredients for the atmosphere of the kingdom of God. Bring every, cap, every thought captive into the, that rises itself against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Watch. Bring it into captivity. Watch what we listen to. Watch what we spend time talking about. What's the atmosphere? Is the, see, this is important, especially in this day and age. Because there is so much negativity. If I watch 20 minutes of news a week, that is huge. Where I used to watch three and four hours a night. And then it dawned on me, this is drivel, drivel, and more drivel. This is repetition, 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 and repetition of drivel. Satan trying to get you sidetracked. Satan trying to get you anxious. Satan, seek ye first the kingdom of God. No, 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 no. If you want to watch news and if God allows you to watch news, watch news. I'm not telling you what to do except seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. So what's the atmosphere you live in? If we believe that God has a good plan for each of us, if we believe that all things work together for good to those that are called according to God's purposes, if we pray in faith, believing that God hears our prayers and answers our prayers, then we can begin to live in an atmosphere of expectancy of the presence, the power, the peace, the provision, and the plan of the Lord. Lay aside doubts. Lay aside the sins that entangle our lives. Live in faith. What's the atmosphere of your life? What do you listen to in the car and at home? What do you watch? What do you talk about when you get together with friends? Is it the kingdom of God? That's up to you. The last thing to live a life focus is what are your actions? Paul in Philippians 3.3 says this. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved. That's Paul, the apostle, these things. Or that I've already reached perfection. You'll reach perfection when you're in the box. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Jesus Christ first possessed me. Brothers and sisters, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Let go of the past. You cannot redo it. You can't fix it. You can't go back. Who had the... uh, uh, Beavis and... Had the time machine, right? Who are the two guys that had the time machine? I just didn't... Sorry, I didn't. I, all I know is names. So, 
Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure had a time machine. You and I do not have a time machine. We can't go back and fix it. I told you I'd never watched it. <laughs> okay. Phil, I apologize. If, if Bill's here, we'll deal with it. Oh, yeah? I learn stuff every day. Okay, forgetting the things that are behind, keep going, reaching for those things that are ahead. I press the goal towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I can pray about some things I've done in the past and the Lord can take care of them. I can ask forgiveness of things, but I can't change them. Amen? I can only press forward with my actions. Therefore, let us, as many of us that are mature, have this mind. Forget the things that are behind us. Get single focused on the things that God has called us to. Love people to life in Jesus Christ. Amen? When the attitude is set, the atmosphere is set. And when the attitude and the atmosphere are set, then the actions have focus, which sets up priorities. I want to compliment each one of you here this morning. When my alarm went off at 5.15, I did not want to get up. The room was cold. The room was dark. The covers were warm. My bed was cozy. What a great day to laze around. But my attitude needs to be aligned to God's Word. My atmosphere is set by His promises and His principles. So therefore, I will get up and I will go to church where God can use me to bless others and others to bless me. I will go into fellowship where God will grow me and grow others with me and with those that are like-minded who have a focus. Amen? I want to encourage you. God's got a call. He's got a gift in your life. Don't get sidetracked. Focus on the thing that God has called you to do, to love people to life. Three focuses for a meaningful life. The three A's of focus for a meaningful life. Attitude, atmosphere, and actions. They free us from the tyranny of time and situations. They free us from the, the tyranny of the urgency. You've got to do this. No, I don't have to do that. I have to be obedient to the Word of God. Amen? Amen. I want to encourage you. Therefore, do not worry. But seek the kingdom of God. Seek the kingdom of God, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry. Four times in that chapter, in the Beatitudes, it says, therefore, four times it says in chapter 6, do not worry, and four times it says, seek the kingdom of God. So that's a pretty good pattern. I probably should have just stood to that in a shorter sermon. Seek the kingdom of God. Therefore, you don't have to worry. You don't have to, to worry. Amen? Our God is more than able. Our God is a good God. Leave the past behind and reach for what He's given to you in the future in the presence of God. Father, we stand right now, Lord, and we just we stand in Your presence, Lord God, and we just declare that You are God. Forgive us for being sidetracked. Forgive us for leaving doors open that the enemy can therein bring havoc to our lives. Lord, we want, to, we want those doors closed.
Lord, we want to not only shed the sins that ensnare us, but Lord, those things that are not beneficial for to our life that may not even be sin, but that are just weighing us down, taking our time. Lord, we want to be all that you've called us to be. So Father, I pray for each person here that there can become this morning a new, renewed understanding, a renewed refreshing. Father, of seeking the kingdom of God, of laying aside everything else, that we might be all that you've called us to be. In Christ Jesus, amen.